learners, today we are going to analyze a play written by Ben Johnson titled The Alchemist. The play has a significant place in the world of comedy. The first evidence of the written and the recorded performance was found in Oxford in the year 1610. The details are also found in the stationer's register in this year though it might have been written and performed earlier than this date. Critics also confirm the date of the performance and the published year as 1610. It was first printed in Quarto in 1612 and entered the second folio of Johnson's works in the year 1616. The Alchemist was set in Blackfriars which also housed a theater where Shakespeare's plays were performed. The play reflects Johnson's wide canvas of learning and reading. It is replete with quotes from other plays and the Old Testament. The play can seem impressive to a modern audience and it is often read as a skeptical and cynical play and argues that even the most apparent illusions are believed by dim-witted or dull people. Yet, there is evidence to suggest that people in Johnson's time really were taken by fraudsters such as portrayed in the play. As Johnson's fame was on the highest pedestal, the alchemist has shed its standing as being purely Elizabethan and serious and critics have reinforced its rise into being known as one of the key texts of the Renaissance. The alchemist has a significant place in the world of literature since Victorian times, often in the company of Johnson's other great comedy, Walpone, it is studied with regard to Johnson's mocking and intriguingly comic views of London in 1610 legality. Belief, faith and the sort of people who believe that they will be one day securing inestimable wealth. Master Lovett abandons the city because of plague, his butler Jeremy, popular as face to his friends of the criminal world, tempts Subtle, a swindler disguised as an alchemist, and Dole Common, a prostitute, to join him in carrying out fraudulent activities. The luck favours the three until an argument takes place between face and Subtle over authority. Dole brings the men back to their senses as she visualizes the bleak future of their money minting plans if the squabble continues. No sooner have Face and Subtle become submissive than Dapper, a gullible lawyer's clerk, Dapper, eager to learn to win all the games of chance, wants to learn the strategies from an eminent astrologer. Two fraudsters relieve Dapper of all his ready cash, in turn for which Subtle predicts that Dapper will enjoy good luck in gaming and also impresses that Queen of Fairy will enhance his worldly success. Able drugger, a young druggist, misled by face, also enters the house. Subtle impresses him through a confusing pharmaceutical and astrological jargon that he will have a rich future and lecherous knight joins the group with his friend Pertinax Surly who knew the art of impressing London men. He is lured by the promise of Subtle that he would get philosopher's stone. Subtle further arouses Mammon's greed by explaining the process of how he is very close to obtaining it. During the discussion, Dole appears unintentionally and Mammon is fascinated at her sight. Immediately, Dole is introduced as an aristocratic lady and an insane lady who is being treated by Dr. Subtle, but who in her moments of sanity is most sociable. Mammon seems to be pleased and promises to send 
to the objects of base metal for the purpose of having them converted into gold. The parade of victims continue. Elder Ananias of the Amsterdam community of extreme protestants is one of them. Subtle pretends to scoff at his impatience and frightens Ananias with a threat to put out forever his alchemist fire. Drugger comes back to be cheated further. Subtle and Face are delighted and the two knaves plot eagerly to get brother and sister into their clutches. Ananias returns with his pastor, tribulation, wholesome for the stone and are ready to purchase Mammon's household articles and Subtle explains that he needs them for the experiment and the money will go towards the care of orphans for whom Subtle says he is responsible. Face further meets a Spanish Don. Dapper returns to meet the Queen of Fairy. At the same time, Drugger brings Castrel to the house and is completely taken in. Castrel is mighty impressed and sends Drugger to bring his sister to the house. After Castrel, Dole, Subtle and Face relieve Dapper of all his money through a ridiculous ritual which allows Dapper to talk to Queen of Fairy. During the process, Mammon enters and woos Dole and Face and Subtle shunts the romantic pair to another part of the house. Young Castrel returns with his widowed sister, Dame Pliant and both are impressed by Subtle's manner and rhetoric. Face introduces the Spaniard to Dame Pliant, who reluctantly agrees to walk in the garden with the Dawn. In another part of the house, Dole pretends to be insane and Subtle realizes that Mammon is madly in love and is sure that he can continue with the story of delay of completion of the Philosopher's Stone. Meanwhile, a sudden loud explosion makes Face report that the laboratory is in mess. Mammon dejectedly leaves the house and Subtle pretends a fainting spell. In the garden, Surly reveals his true identity to Dame Pliant and warns the young widow against the swindlers. Face, in desperation, tells Castrel that Surly is an imposter who is trying to steal Dame Pliant away. Unable to face the other fraudsters, Surly departs, followed by Castrel. Subtle is relieved and Dame Pliant in, is in Dole's care. Lovett's entry changes the whole plot when Lovett makes a sudden entry. Face quickly becomes Jeremy, his butler, and entertains him to allow Subtle and Dole to escape. But Face is exposed and confesses everything to his master and promises to provide him with a wealthy young widow as his wife, if Lovett will have mercy on his servant. Subtle manages to send the young Dapper and he along with Dole try to escape. But Lovett thwarts their attempts and they escape empty-handed by the back gate. Lovett wins the hand of Dame Blind and in his good humour forgives his crafty butler. Others are finally convinced that they have been cheated and as a result of their own selfishness and greed. The first one is alchemy. The theory of alchemy presents that things are always in a dynamic state and several parts of the play deal openly with this theme. Not only do the characters themselves change into other characters, but their commodities, their fears and their faith are easily transformed into gold by the fraudsters. Naturally, Subtle's status as the alchemist is questioned throughout the play. What can he really transform after all? 
the process of alchemy itself is related clearly to theatre, because in addition to theatrical transformations, theatre offers a fantasy world in which magical things can happen, which every individual dreams of silently. The second important theme is gold. Gold is the result of thriving alchemy. It dominates the major part of the play and motivation for just about everything that happens. The girls are all greedy for gold in order to achieve their dreams and they are therefore greedy for the philosopher's stone. Face epilogue considers the fact that a theatre audience similarly has handed over gold in order to be knowingly tricked with a false story on stage. The first important character, Subtle. The alchemist of the play is Subtle and we never learn whether Subtle is a surname. True to his name, Subtle is grumpy, crafty and continually at odds with face and is very learned, being the one with alchemical expertise. He disguises himself as a doctor to carry out his con. Second character is Face, also known as Jeremy, seems to some extent faceless and has a blurred character and personality and is constantly switching roles. He is essential in finding the gulls in the pubs of London and bringing them to the Brackfriars house. Third important character is Dole or Dorothy. Dorothy called as Dole is in itself a pun meaning everyone's because Dole is a prostitute. She is not as significant as face or subtles, yet her one makeover into a royal lady is essential in manipulating mammon into the right place at the right time. She escapes with subtle over the back wall at the end without a share of the goods. Next character is Dapper. Dapper, a gambling fly, is tempted by face, is awfully greedy and naive. Subtle tells him that his relative of the fairy queen, upon his return, he is locked in the privy for most of the play. The next character is Abel or the drugger. Abel is an honest soul and a young tobacconist who meets face in a pub. Face pretends to be a doctor and Abel wants advice from him on feng shui of the building. He is tricked into handing over a lot of expensive tobacco and into bringing Castrol and Dame Pliant into the Blackfriars house. At the end of the play, he loses everything and is dispatched with a punch from Lovett. Well, Lovett is, owns the house and employs Jeremy the butler, his housekeeper also called Face. Lovett returns unexpectedly after a long gap, though Face lies and claims to have sent for him. The lies disturbs Lovett and he punishes Face, later marries Dame Pliant and leaves the stage halfway through the epilogue in order to smoke tobacco. Sir Epicure Mammon. Epicure Mammon, the words literally mean and material pleasure and enjoyment is the most significant character of all and is popular as the greediest gull. He is very keen to possess the philosopher's stone and is obsessed with food, sex and the scheme of getting his riches turned into gold by the philosopher's stone. His lust is the reason given by the fraudsters for the explosion that destroys the imaginary furnace and crushes his hopes of becoming rich. Ananias, a deacon of Amsterdam. Ananias is a power monger and short tempered and quick to attack anything that may not be, as he sees it, Christian. And on numerous occasions, he blurts out furiously that, for example, Christ tied is the right. Christian name for Christmas. Ananias is also the name of a New Testament character who is wounded dead because of his greed. Another character is Castrel, also known as Angry Boy and is keen to learn the skill of quarrelling. 
formal, rhetorical and argumentative. He has come to subtle to master them. Clearly young and impressionable, he is very caring over his sister Dame Pliant and he goes to huge lengths to seem one of the guys in several of the group scenes. His quarrelling is rather unimpressive. Ludicrously, he seems to know only a handful of insults, including you lie and you are a pimp. Dame Pliant. Dame Pliant is widowed sister of Castrol and is also called a widow in the play. Dame Pliant literal meaning is supple or flexible. True to her name, she seems one of the funniest and dull characters in the play or in literature characters. When she does speak, very rarely, she has the same speech mannerism, example, sister as her brother. In the end, it is Lovett who marries the girl with no wits. In the play The Alchemist, Johnson's scathing attack on the follies, vanities and vices of mankind, particularly greed-infested innocence. People of all social classes are taken into the fold of Johnson's brutal satirical wit. He makes fun of human weakness and credulity to advertising and to miracle cures by creating the character of Sir Epicure Mammon, who dreams of drinking the elixir of youths and enjoying improbable sexual pleasures. The trio of fraudulent artists, Subtle, Face and Dole are small timer cons who are governed by the same human weaknesses who exploit the same in their victims. Their fate is foreshadowed in the play's opening scene which features them together in the house of Lovett, Face Master. They together exist in an uneasy imbalance like alchemical elements that will create a wobbly reaction. The fraudulent artists, vanities and aspirations are exposed by the very person they assume as part of their plan. Their relentless bickering is fueled by vanity, envy and jealousy, the root of which is Suttle's confidence that he is a key element in the venture tripartite. The Alchemist is a closely knit play which is a simple dramatic concept. Subtle claims to be on the brink of projection in his offstage workroom, but all the characters in the play are obsessed with projection of a different kind, image projection. The outcome in structural terms is an onstage base of operations in friars to which can be brought a succession of unconsciously comic characters from varied social backgrounds who come from different professional backgrounds and different beliefs but whose lowest common denominator is credulity which confers on them equal victim status in the end. Johnson treasures his brutal satire to describe these Puritan characters, perhaps because the Puritans in real life were keen to close down the theatres. Johnson's play Bartholomew Fair is also anti-Puritan and asking people to be away from the pleasures of the world. Tellingly, of all those gulled in the play, it is the Puritans alone whom Johnson denies a brief moment of his audience pity. In all probability, he considers their life-denying conceit renders them unworthy of it. Johnson time and again scorns at hypocrisy, especially religious hypocrisy that couches its damning judgments in an ornate language. Tribulation and Ananias call their fellow men heathens in one instance and say that someone's hat suggests the Antichrist, that these Puritans are just as money minded as the rest of the characters as part of the ironic comedy. In many English and European comedies, it is up to so called sophisticated and refined characters to resolve the perplexity that has been caused by lower class characters. 
in the alchemist johnson destabilizes this tradition face master lovett at first seems to affirm his social and ethical dominance to take control of the situation and put matters right but when face throws the bait of prospect of marriage to a younger woman his master enthusiastically accepts both master and the servant are always on the lookout for how to get ahead and progress in life in spite of ethical boundaries lovett dexterously exploits mammon's disinclination to obtain legal certification of his folly to hold on to the old man's money many records and evidences indicate that the play was written for performance at blackfriars paradoxically the beginning of the play shows that plague compelled the company to tour and the alchemist premiered at oxford in 1610 with performance in london later that year its success may be measured through its performance at court in 1613 and again in the year 1623 substantiation of a more vague kind is presented by the case of thomas tomkes albumazar performed for king james 1 at cambridge in the year 1615 a tradition actually originating with dryden held that johnson had been influenced by tomkes academic comedy dryden may have mentioned johnson to increase interest in a somewhat incomprehensible play he was then reviving he may also have been confused about the dates the play continued on stage as a comedy during the commonwealth period after the restoration it belonged to the repertory of king's men of thomas killigrew who appeared to have performed it with some frequency during their initial years in operation the play does not have any records which show that it has not been performed between the year 1675 and 1709 but the regularity of performance after 1709 indicates that it probably was indeed the play was frequently performed during the 18th century the actors colly sibber and david garrick were quite successful in the role of dragger for whom a small amount of new material including farces and monologues in the later half of the century was created after this period of popularity the play fell into the passive phase along with nearly all non shakespearean renaissance drama until the beginning of the 20th century william pole's Elizabethan Stage Society produced the play in 1899. This opening was followed a generation later by productions at Malvern in the year 1932 with Ralph Richardson as face and at the Old Vic in 1947. In the later production, Alec Guinness played Drugger alongside Richardson as face. In 1962, Tyrone Guthrie produced a restructured version at the Old Vic, with Leo Macon as Subtle and Charles Gray as Mammon. Trevor Nunn's 1977 production with the Royal Shakespeare Company featured Ian McKellen as a greasy, misanthropic face in a version adapted by Peter Barnes. The original was played. at the Royal National Theatre with Alex Jennings and Simon Russell Bale in the key roles from September to November 2006 a modern day dress production directed by Michael Kahn opened the 2009-2010 season at the Shakespeare in Washington DC another contemporary dress production was directed by Tariq Leslie and produced by Ensemble Theatre Cooperative at Zerico Arts Centre Vancouver Canada in the summer of 2012 well this was a nutshell the theatre performance of this play
I hope you enjoyed this play and its subtle message to the society. Thank you.